Thank you for joining us for Health Talks. I'm Gail Hogan. Research experts at the James are studying virtually all facets of bladder cancer, including why some resist certain therapies. Dr. Deb Sundi is here to tell us more and what that means for patients. Welcome, Dr. Sundi. Thank you. What is bladder cancer? Bladder cancer is a type of cancer that starts in the lining of the urinary bladder. Is it something that is treatable, caught early? It is. It's very treatable. It's often curable, especially if you catch it early. So speaking of catching it early, what are some of the symptoms of bladder cancer? The most common symptom of bladder cancer is called hematuria, which means blood in the urine. So if you see blood in your urine, there's about a 13 to 15 percent chance of being diagnosed with a bladder cancer. Um, so if there's blood in the urine, therefore it's really important to have that evaluated by a urologist. And the, and the way we do that is we insert a camera called a flexible cystoscope into the bladder as part of an evaluation that all, often also includes uh, a CT scan. There are some other warning signs of bladder cancer. Those can include obstructive urinary symptoms, um, which in, in other words is trying to urinate but having trouble expelling the urine from your bladder. Um, and there may be other more subtle urinary symptoms as well, irritative voiding symptoms, symptoms that kind of mimic urinary tract infections such as bladder irritation uh, with, with urination. If someone does see blood in their urine, how soon should they see a doctor? I mean, some folks would think, maybe this isn't a big deal or it will go away. If you see blood in your urine, it's important to see a urologist relatively quickly. Um, it is true that most cases, uh, let's say 85% or so of cases uh, where someone sees blood in the urine is actually not caused by bladder cancer, which is really reassuring. Um, in, in some cases, it's caused by enlargement of the prostate. It could be caused by inflammation of the bladder, bladder infection. Uh, there are some extreme um, athletes who might experience blood in the urine after you know, running a marathon or something like that. So there are many causes of blood in the urine. Blood in the urine does not necessarily mean you have bladder cancer, but there is a, a real chance that bladder cancer is the cause, and, and the best way to evaluate that is by cystoscopy in a urologist's office as well as often a CT scan um, or some other imaging study, and, and that should be done fairly quickly. If someone does have bladder cancer, doctor, can, does that cancer spread? It can spread, um, and it's important to catch it early before it spreads. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give you an, an example um, with some statistics. So um, if someone has an invasive bladder cancer, that's grown into the deep muscular backing of the bladder. We call that muscle invasive bladder cancer. The median or average time for that cancer to spread to other parts of the body, we in oncology refer to that as metastatic progression, is six months. And once a bladder cancer has metastasized or spread to other parts of the body, overall survival um, on average uh, is relatively short. It's only about a year or two years with treatment. Um, so it's always treatable, but if you can catch a tumor before it spreads, uh, that's the whole point of early detection because the lower stage bladder tumors are very highly treatable and often curable. That was my next question. What do you mean difference between treatable and curable? Every bladder cancer is treatable, uh, no matter what the stage, whether it's early stage, invasive but still localized to the bladder, or perhaps even metastasized to other organs. We have treatments that have activity in all stages of this disease. Um, what differs is that the presenting stage of someone's bladder cancer will be connected to the likelihood of response and the probability of long-term disease control. So a non-invasive bladder cancer, we can treat. And depending on whether the cells are aggressive or not, um, we can provide additional medical, medical or surgical therapy to control recurrences. That's the hallmark of non-invasive bladder cancers. They're often nuisances. You treat them, they come back, you need monitoring to, to make sure it doesn't cause any problems. It requires lifelong medical attention. A muscle invasive localized bladder cancer will require more intensive treatments, such as chemotherapy and surgery, or chemotherapy and radiation therapy. The, the chance of long-term disease control, cure if you want to call it that, um, is about 60 to 65 percent over a five-year period. 
So very highly treatable, but cure is not guaranteed. Um, and, and finally, um, what about if you've been diagnosed with metastatic bladder cancer? It's already spread to other parts of your body. Well, that doesn't always mean it's not curable. It can be. Um, there are actually a proportion of patients, let's say 25 to 35 percent, who will have tremendous responses with chemotherapy or immunotherapy. I'll give you an example that uh, last week I saw a patient in the office who was diagnosed with metastatic bladder cancer 13 years ago. Most people would say, oh, well, you know, that's really disappointing. I've only got an average life expectancy of one to two years, but he's got not a cancer cell in his body, doing great, and, um, and, and those stories are really um, um, inspiring. They make you want to keep doing what you're doing, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you talked about the different stages of bladder cancer. Why are some bladder cancers resistant to some treatments? As a field, we and others are, are doing a fair bit of research to try to understand what the molecular drivers of bladder cancer are and what the causes of therapeutic resistance are. So the cause of a bladder cancer to not respond to various therapies depends on what kind of what therapy you're using. So, you know, sometimes we'll use chemotherapy in the bladder. Sometimes we'll use immunotherapy in the bladder. Sometimes it'll be chemotherapy or immunotherapy given systemically or intravenously. Sometimes it'll be surgery or radiation, sometimes targeted therapies, um, sometimes a new class of molecules called antibody drug conjugates. So the bottom line is whatever the mechanism of action is of the drug or treatment modality you're using, if there's a recurrence or progression, then our assumption in the field is that the molecular driver that is promoting growth of those cancer cells is a different signal. You might have hit one target, but perhaps a different target is actually the, the, the cause of the signal. So that's one way to understand therapeutic resistance. Because immunotherapy is playing a growing role in bladder cancer and bladder cancer treatment, what we're also understanding is that a, an individual person's own immune system uh, might have different uh, features or uniqueness or variability that influences their body's immune response against a bladder cancer. And one of the areas of active research in that area that's really being led here at the James is the, the topic of sex differences in anti-tumor immunity in bladder cancer. What we've been learning, and we're doing a lot of work to follow up on this, is that the T cells, which are the immune cells that have the capability of killing cancer cells, in bladder cancer, T cells are really different between males and females. And the T cells in males seem to have a more exhausted or less functional um, phenotype. And that may be part of the reason that bladder cancer is much more commonly diagnosed in males and females. It's diagnosed in males and females, but then how about treatment? Does that differ by sex? Currently, it does not. Currently, bladder cancer treatments are, are independent of sex. That may change in the, in the near future. Um, because of increasingly um, recognized sex differences in, in the biology of bladder cancer, um, it's possible that in the near future we may use a class of medicines called antiandrogens to treat bladder cancers depending on, on uh, the level of androgen signaling in someone's tumor, and that may be uh, related to sex. So um, on that topic, we're actually um, here at the James, one of a, a small number of centers opening a clinical trial of anti-androgen medicines in bladder cancer. I was just going to ask about more research in that area, and I know research always includes clinical trials, so you're obviously working in that area. Very actively, yes. So. Um, in, in terms of bladder cancer research, we uh, try to cover all the aspects. We're studying the basic science of bladder cancer biology, uh, what drives cancer cell growth, how immune cells can be modulated to attack those bladder cancer cells better. We're doing a fair bit of translational research where we're using uh, uh, studies of, of bladder cancers that um, are sourced from patients here at the James who consent to uh, participate in research, and, and of course also in clinical trials. What is BCG, and is it considered immunotherapy? Great question. BCG is an immunotherapy. Uh, it's actually a bacterial immunotherapy. BCG stands for Bacillus calment garen. 
It's, uh, it's actually a, a bacteria that's closely related to the type of bacteria that causes tuberculosis, believe it or not. And uh, what BCG does is it's actually just a, it, it's a medicine in a bottle and, and it's um, dripped into someone's bladder, um, specifically if that person has what's referred to as high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. These bladder cancers are non-invasive, but they tend to recur often. And so what BCG does is when it goes into the bladder, this solution of living bacteria really inflames the, uh, really inflames the bladder. And by doing so, uh, it, it results in infiltration of the bladder by a lot of a patient's own immune cells. Some of the immune cells have cancer-fighting properties, and that's why BCG is a very effective immunotherapy that really cuts down on bladder cancer recurrence and progression for patients with high-risk, non-muscle invasive bladder cancers. Where do you see the future in this, as far as treatment options go? I think uh, the future in bladder cancer will incorporate more of a, a personalized medicine approach. Um, you know, right now, our treatment approach, and, and the treatment approach is endorsed by national and international guideline societies, uh, will lump patients by grade and stage into different risk categories and um, really for the past few decades we've had kind of a one-size-fits-all approach uh, with treatments tailored to maybe someone's overall health profile or their ability to, to tolerate certain medicines. In recent years we've learned that some tumor types might express a molecule um, that would render them more likely to respond to a different targeted therapy or immunotherapy. And, and with each year, I think as a field, we're getting better and better at, at incorporating this personalized medicine approach in bladder cancer. So why should patients choose the James and the treatment that you can offer here? If you've been diagnosed with bladder cancer, I, I do think there's a tremendous advantage in having a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation uh, and a multidisciplinary treatment, consultation, and treatment at a comprehensive cancer center such as the James. The reason for that is bladder cancer diagnosis and care can be incredibly complex. There are uh, many nuances uh, in this disease, no matter what the stage and, 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 and grade of diagnosis. Um, so in, in that vein, I feel really lucky here at the James to be working with a number of other colleagues who are really specialized in the, in the treatment of bladder cancer. I'm a surgical expert in the, in the care of, of, of bladder cancer, and I communicate every day with medical oncologists and radiation oncologists and radiologists and pathologists who have tremendous specialization in bladder cancer. And I, I think that's so key because if you're really specialized, which you can be at a, at a big cancer center like the James, then you can catch the nuances that matter. So when you talk to your patients, do you feel like you can offer hope? Absolutely in every case and that's you know I think what what makes me so um, you know lucky to be able to participate in, in bladder cancer care whether you have an early stage cancer or a late stage cancer or something in between you've got options uh, and all of the options uh, have different profiles and, and we can work together to try to figure out what what meets uh, someone's goals the best. Thanks Dr. Sundy nice to talk with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for Health Talks.